Hey, Keys Mods fans, this video is when we traveled up to Gainesville, Florida this fall uh, for the Southern Lepidoptera Society annual meeting. It's a great time when all of the members of the Southern Lepidoptera Society, and usually in conjunction with the Tropical Lepidoptera Society, we all meet up in one place. It's a great thing. And so I'm going to be presenting my uh, my talk, a short talk on Chlorostrum and my CDs, the uh, how we discovered sea grape as the host plant, larval host plant for this butterfly. I'm gonna just share the uh, a brief video that of that lecture that I gave. Um, and then, you know, we had a banquet later, we had a good time, some pictures of some of the lepidopterists that are in this society. So guys, if you want information on the Southern Lepidoptera Society, uh, you can visit this website and I'll have it linked in my bio and you can get a registration form. It's like 30 bucks a year. And you get four, four newsletters a year and in, invited to the annual meeting, but you get to meet really cool, very smart people that know a lot about butterflies and moths. So guys, check this out. Uh, Southern Lepidoptera Society annual meeting in Gainesville, Florida, 2023. Trying to figure things out. I love these little times where, where you get to find neat Lepidoptera with, right in the uh, right in your backyard. And so Chlorostrum in Mycetes was a butterfly that, or is a butterfly that for, since I was 19 years old, I remember coming to my first Southern Lepidoptera Society meeting at 19. And um, and just starting to ask around, because I love hair streaks, my favorite group. And asking uh, folks around, where do we find this amethyst hair streak thing? And, uh, you know, I know that Albezia Levick was, was a reported host and this, this, these massive, massive legumes trees that are, you know, 40, 50 feet tall and uh, that the larvae feed on the, on, the, on the flowers and the buds of these big trees. And so, um, you know, I, I went and got one when I bought a house and planted it and this, this massive, massive tree started growing in my house and over a decade later, uh, I never saw a single mycetes associated with it, but uh, I looked, man. I had a you know a thousand man hours of, in the field looking for this thing, and uh, for me it was a unicorn. Uh, and and so this little hair streak, this was back in 1998, and Bahia Honda Key was the first one I had ever seen, and uh, it was on a sea grape leaf, uh, nonetheless, and it's a female, I believe, and. Uh, I saw it, it was probably 15 feet high. Uh, I, it's a really grainy uh, image that I took there with my older camera, but was able to snap my first picture of the uh, amethyst hair streak. Uh, a few years later, this one was found in, in, uh, in Davie, Florida, so it's out west. And there was no Albezia Levick trees anywhere associated with this area. And uh, this was in a, a person's yard, and he was uh, not interested in allowing me to collect there. But there was, <laughs> but there was a, uh, a, it was a colony. They, there was over the course of I think three weeks or four weeks, he found a number of individuals, and he had published that there was males and females all visiting uh, his, you know, the, the Bidens that he had growing in his garden, as well as. Um, um, the uh, blood bearing, what's it called? Cordia glabrosa. And so, uh, but that, when I traveled there that one time, I found this male that was uh, the first really up close, nice kind of image I ever got. I fast forward until uh, this past year, about a year ago, or last year, and I think it was June, on the iNaturalist website, uh, my CDs was posted, a, a photograph of a female chlorostrum in my CDs was uh, posted from a park right down the street from my house, mm -hmm. and its little abdomen was curled on the flowers, or the uh, developing flowers, the buds of uh, Coccoloba ovifera, the sea grape. And so uh, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion about that fact that it was laying eggs, <laughs> but it sure looked like it to me, so I, uh, I contacted a few of these folks and this guy Michael Green is a I think he's 15 years old he lives in Boynton Beach down there and, um, and he has got a little YouTube channel and so he he actually went and found one and posted this photograph uh, in in April this year so fast forward a year now we're in 2023 he posted this photograph 
same location. I had, and I had gone to that location in Quiet Waters Park about uh, a dozen times and I'd never seen one. I didn't see one uh, at that one sea grape tree. And so I found out about that probably July. So it was later, later on in the summer last year. For fast forward this year, uh, he posts this photograph in April, and uh, obviously is a, that's a very, very fresh specimen, uh, <laughs> hours old. So, yeah, sea, <laughs> sea grape trees became my new best friend. And um, uh, I, did, how far north does sea grape grow? Did they, did they grow up here? Probably not, Saint right? Augustine, I think. Up yeah, to St. Augustine? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's pretty far up on the East Coast, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, for me, the my thousand man hours for this butterfly were spent in Florida Keys and, you know, South Miami, you know, roaming around South Miami because that's my understanding of where it was always found. And it's probably where the specimens were found from, from, from this group. And, uh, but I, I kept hearing rumors that, hey, I, I saw one of those in Jupiter. Or right, now this person found one in Davie, and I've, you know, so now there's, and the, the records didn't make sense based on the host plant association. So we, I kind of had a suspicion that there was something going on there. And of course, um, Bill Beck and, and uh, Lee Williams and Amy Grimm uh, posted, uh, pu published a art, nice article in the Lepsock, I think it was, was it last year or two years ago, uh, about the fact that they had found them in Big Pine Key uh, associated with buttonwood. And I don't know that they ever, I, I know that they found the, this incredible colony. They have this lady, uh, Amy Grimm, had this two-story uh, balcony house. And on the balcony, she could see sort of the canopy of some of, this, some of these plants. And she found some very interesting behaviors of hair streaks. You know, I grew up thinking hair streaks, you go out in the middle of the day, bright sun. Uh, that's, you know, that's when you go hunt for hair streaks. Uh, if there's cloud cover or rain, you know, just put your net away. Well, not these guys. So they're, they become mainly active in the evenings, 6, 7 o'clock p.m., all the way up to 8, 15, 8, 20 p.m. And that's when they do all their courtship and they do all the spiraling uh, thing. And so, uh, and she also recorded in that, uh, in that article that they like to walk. They like to walk around instead of fly, which is which is also you know very interesting. Now, the tree of life. <laughs> once once I started uh, this year, probably April May, iNaturalist blew up with hundreds of photographs of my CDs, all on sea grape, and so I, I started looking everywhere. Every sea grape tree I found that I would see, I started looking. Uh, and in passing, but you know, I'm usually driving by, dropping my kids off at this, and you know, going to and from work. So on this day in early June this past this summer, uh, I'm, I come to pick up a friend of mine to bring them her to the airport. It was six o'clock p.m., and I go up this little staircase right here to uh, pick up her luggage to bring it down to my car, and. I see the sea grape tree. So I just kind of glanced over and sure enough, sitting <laughs> sitting right there was a female uh, Chlorostrymon mycetes. So I snap a quick picture. I mean, this is like a couple of feet from my, from my face, but we were in a hurry. Of course, I was in my wife's vehicle without a net. Um, and, <laughs> and so I had to come back and um, let me go backwards here for a second. But here's on the balcony of this uh, little apartment complex looking at the sea grape tree. Now this tree produced a lot, a lot of, I mean, there, every time we went there for the next month, we saw one, at least one every day and multiple individuals, sometimes up to seven or eight on this one tree. And it's a, it's an isolated tree. So if you, if you're to look at Margate, the city of Margate in Florida, it is a concrete jungle. And, there, and there's nothing else around, not even remotely interesting for the, in the concept of Lepidoptera. But this tree, when it was in full bloom, um, you know, there's a lot of hair streaks too. You know, Electrostrymon and Gilia were everywhere. You have to sift through, you know, 20 and Gilia to get to find one Mycetes. Uh, 
moving forward, the, the hunt for sea grape trees and, oh, I got kicked out of there, by the way, because I was going to her place uh, <laughs> with my big, long extension net. Uh, and uh, the, the grounds people started getting complaints about this weirdo. Uh, <laughs> what's he doing? And, and so I'm like, I'm just, it's about science. Come on, let me, and they, they said no. So I had to wait till she came back from Argentina to, um, to you know, get permission, but then it was too late. So on, our, on the hunt for uh, more sea grape trees, we found that uh, in South Florida, they're used as, in a big, long, you know, there's a lot of sea grape trees used in landscaping. And when we find that when there's too many of them, it's not, they're not as easy to find. But when you have an isolated tree that's just in the middle of, there's nothing else really around, they just, they just colonize on this tree. And there's one in a parking lot on Pompano Beach. There's a, the fishing pier is right, you know, to the... Uh, let's see, over here somewhere. And we parked there. Now the problem is they charge like $6 an hour to park. <laughs> so uh, parking in South Florida just to go to the beach is, is ridiculous. But um, I would say, son, quick, get the net before the parking guy comes. You know, meet the guy comes. So uh, this is my son, Lorenzo. Uh, he has had very little interest in Lepidoptera. Uh, despite all of my efforts, but when I when I started explaining to him how rare this thing was and unusual, he's like, "Dad, let's go get him." I'm like, "All right, let's do it." So he he became very good at it. his first butterfly ever. It's chlorostrum in my seed oh, yeah. with a net, so that's good for him. He doesn't realize how yeah. cool that is. But uh, this this tree, we wound up catching a couple of them, but a, a lot of times they're way up here. So even with your fully extended um, tropics net. Uh, extension net it was very difficult here's another picture this is at the boat ramp in Pompano uh, I bring my boat there to go fishing regularly and never you know never thought to look up into the sea grape trees to um, to find these these butterflies but that's that's what it's like to get these things you know and I'm just hoping that this upcoming spring I can make it good with the maintenance people at the apartment complex there and then when we talk about 18 footers we're talking about a boat not the length yeah man and, and i'd love an 18 foot but i'm still stuck with 16 man just maybe one day yeah i even sent my son up the up the tree i'm not climbing any trees but uh that might have been the easier way to do it but there's a few trees there um, Jeff Slotten came down, visited me, you know, tried, he, he tried hard, it was Unsuccessful. unsuccessfully, but um, there we are. Now, um, when at the Tree of Life, at the, at the apartment complex, uh, there was one day in particular, I think it was June 10th, where uh, I wound up catching four females, one, run, one right after another, and in doing so, I, I noticed this little green slug in my net bag, and I wound up, I wound up taking five wild larvae that day just from that, uh, from that tree, just from just knocking the blooms and you know beating them into the into the net bag. Uh, here's our our little hair streak, our, our female hair streaks feeding there on the sugar water solution. Uh, they lived for over a week. Uh, I think I had them over a week in captivity, uh, feeding them every day. This was the setup. I have a 16 ounce cup here. Uh, and I, I have a, a little piece of screening. I, I stole one of my wife's uh, hair ties to keep the screen down. Uh, what I have a big problem with white-footed ants. Every time I try to set something up with to get eggs, the white-footed ants, within minutes, white-footed ants come out of nowhere and try to eat my butterflies. So I have a, a little cup here with water. I created a little moat so that the white-footed ants couldn't get in. Uh, I have this Q-tip here with sugar water on the inside, and I kind of inserted the Q-tip in there, so that way uh, they they wound up learning to go to the Q-tip for for uh, for water. I would just change that out twice a day, and that's that's how I would feed them most of the time. And then of course I I kept the lid sort of like not snapped down, but just uh, just off to the side a little bit to keep the humidity level so that the blooms wouldn't dry out. They they dry out real quick and they. They spoil real quick, so that's a problem. Here's a, um, she's dropping an egg right here, which is pretty cool. Um, now, it, the the first few the first few days, 
I, I probably missed a lot of eggs, you know, and, and I, I'm 45 now. This past year and a half have been hard on my eyesight, and, and finding lysinid eggs is usually difficult. But I didn't realize how how well they hide them. And so there's one right in here, and they wedge. That's a one talented little butt they have. So they wedge. <laughs> They wedge those eggs inside of these little crevices, and it's it's very impressive. And I think I may have even missed some of those eggs because it just looks like, uh, just by the naked eye, it looks like a, it looks like part of the part of the uh, the bud that's developing. So I think I may have missed some of them, but I uh, started started catching on. Uh, here's an egg here. We got actually two eggs, one here, one there, and this is uh, this is actually only after two days. Uh, after being cut from the tree, even even in water, the, the cuttings just don't last very long, so you have to keep changing them out quite often. Um, those are our eggs. The best way to find the, the, the early caterpillars is looking for the frass. You know, they, they burrow into the mud and they start pushing out the poop out here, out the little holes, and you can start finding it piling up, and that's the best way to know that you have uh, hatches. Here's a, a hatched egg, and the hole that it bur the larva burrowed into the little bud of the uh, sea grape bud. Here's a, I believe, a second or third. I mean, it's probably third inch star larvae uh, burrowing into, actively burrowing into a bud, and then of course his sibling over here. Full grown caterpillars. We've got, you know, dark form, green form. These are these are siblings from the same egg, egg group. And some of them turned this pink, kind of pink coloration, kind of normal lysinid uh, coloration. Now, I don't know if anybody can help me. My first wild caught larva that I was feeding, you know, trying to get them to pupate, when I saw it going pre-pupal, it, it went to the um, paper towel and started doing its thing, getting ready to pupate. I found these little, these little critters here that had a, a high degree of interest in my caterpillar. And I, I does anybody know what these are? Are they Okay. Are, are they like feeding on my caterpillar? Or are they taking, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't let them live long enough to find out. <laughs> but I, I figured I'd snap a quick, it even took some self-control just to snap the picture before killing them. Um, but they get off my caterpillar. But at, at this time, the wild caterpillars that I found I still wasn't certain that were, they were my seedies. I, they could be uh, Angelia, because Angelia also mm -hmm. feeds on Jamaican dogwood and mm -hmm. um, you know a, a number of a number of plants. I think they've been reared on mango uh, buds. So I was hoping I'm like, please let them be my seedies and not Angelia. So I wasn't sure what this caterpillar was at that time, the wild caught one. So there was a high degree of anxiety when I found these bugs sucking on my. Uh, caterpillar. Uh, we found we had a pupa shortly after, and then a few days later, I was very pleased uh, to see the, the the bright blue wing pads uh, shining shining through there. Uh, and a couple of days later, it came. Now there was a, a number of other things that we found associated that were um, really competing with the fresh buds on you know in the cups. And when I take the cuttings of the of the sea grape and put them into the containers to rear the caterpillars. Obviously, there's always little eggs of little tiny moths that would always pop up, and I'm sure there's people here that are more interested in this uh, than my blue hair streak. But um, this is what popped out, and um, I have not gotten an identification on it yet, but it's, it's a brown micro. We'll, we'll get there eventually. Uh, I found these guys as well on the sea grape, and um, James, what, what do we call this, this new Oh yeah, that's uh, Carutus sex fasciella. Yeah, this new newly introduced thing. It's a, a, a pest to um, ficus species, and there was a ficus species close, uh, a strangler fig close by, uh, but these guys were all over the sea grape blooms as well, probably nectaring. Now we have our first uh, emerged uh, butterfly, Mycetes. His wings weren't dry yet, but um, I couldn't help myself. Got them out and see if I get some some photographs of the open wings, and uh, and then he dried up and took some better pictures. 
And uh, there's our pair. Uh, there's a rear pair of Chlorostrum in my CDs. So uh, since then, guys, we've um, probably the month of month of June, I found, I believe I'm up to 18 colonies of, of my CDs all within a couple miles of my house, including two houses down, there's a huge sea grape tree. And, I was, and it, they, they were right there all this time. And to my shame, uh, I've been hunting for this thing for 20 something years. <laughs> and they're, 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 and here's what I found. They're, they're literally all over Broward County and we just didn't know where to look. So it was pretty cool. All right, grand prize, guys. All right. Uh, did did you not want a book? Some. Oh, you did get one. Yeah. Okay. Did Joe get one? Yeah. Joe yeah, Joe. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Grand prize. All right. And does anybody want a bottle of wine? I'm giving this away for free. <laughs> there you go. That was great. That, hey, James. James. I'm sorry. Didn't get anything. That's perfect. Okay. Grand prize. Everybody has equal shot. Everybody's tickets back in. Drum roll, please. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. It We're comes, going. It comes with uh, the sheet and a hundred foot of cord as well. Hundred foot of cord. All right. All right. Here goes. Drum roll. Drum Grand roll. roll. Je Jeff wants in. <laughs> oh, that's right. Mark, do you want in on this too? Okay. Uh, then I need to write two more tickets. I don't know what happened to Mark's because I know I wrote Mark on. <laughs> That's sure. it, man. It's, 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 it's less chance of the lottery. Yeah, you're, you're way, oh, there's chances a lot are bigger, way better. There's a lot bigger chance of the lottery. So who else needs one? Mark. And Mark needs one, too. And what's your name? Yeah, it's your name. No, he's, he's good. Oh, he, you're good? He's good. I, I had two under my name. He was one of them. Okay. So I have Jeff. Because I have Jeff. I just put Jeff in. Oh. Okay, Mark. Yeah, Mark. This is slot. Okay. Okay. Slot is already. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Here it goes. For the 175 watt mercury vapor lamp with the sheet. Put some pressure on Megan. She's gonna draw. James Adams. James Adams. Congrats, man! Heck yeah! <laughs> that wasn't rigged at all! <laughs> That's, and that is how we do Southern Lep Adopter Society. Southern Lep's meetings, man, that's awesome.